Can you hear me? Okay, then you may want to leave now before I get talking. <laughs> could go on, could go on for a few hours. Hi, I'm Bart Roselli, uh, director of the. <laughs> we like this audience already. Uh, director of the museum, and here to uh, kick off uh, another in our series of programs this season about cultural identity and how it's expressed in stories. If you heard our first speaker talk about the, the, the legend of La Llorona, uh, today will be about objects, in particular Mimbre's pots. It sh this should be very cool. And uh, it, next month, the talk will be about how various cultural identities are expressed in food, one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to introduce, I'm just going to uh, share a few logistical issues, uh, information with you, and then I'm going to introduce someone who's new to the museum staff, who's going to be taking over the lead for pulling this series together going forward, so stay tuned. Uh, every, almost everybody has been here, you know where the restrooms are, and um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we appreciate uh, masks, even though the Silco has installed very good HEPA filters. Um, it's always good to be safe. Um, we ask, uh, once the program is completed, we have a survey. We have a way of asking you how we did. And for suggestions for other topics um, and uh, sp even speakers. So if you would just take a few minutes at the end, fill out one of those surveys, we'd really appreciate it. And then of course, uh, even though the museum is a department of the town of Silver City, like the police department and the fire department, uh, budgets are tight. So the town supports a lot of our operating costs, but not all of them. So any spare change in your pockets uh, would be very helpful. We have, we want to thank our Silver City Museum Society, a nonprofit board that raises additional funds so that we can buy new PA equipment or bring in a speaker from uh, out of town and other costs uh, that help make the museum a vibrant piece of our community. Um, I think that's all the, the news. Uh, stay tuned if you're not a member of the museum. Uh, there are membership applications, a, me a member of the society. Um, you get our quarterly newsletter. You get invitations to special members only previews of new exhibits. Um, we just opened one last week or so, Arte Chicano 2022, and we had a great turnout, two artists uh, local artists with Hispanic uh, heritage, uh, a, an exhibit curated by the energetic, she seems to be like the, energi uh, the energizing, energizer buddy, bunny of uh, Silver City, Diane Ingalls Leba, does great work with the youth mural program as well as curating Arte Chicano. That's up. Yeah, I see somebody clapping. She deserves a round. And in October, although we haven't um, announced it widely yet, there is a new collection of photographs coming to the Silver City Museum. Photographs never before seen by the public, but a very, very important collection of photographs documenting mining life uh, in Grant County in the four, 1940s and 50s and 60s. Um, who's not heard of the salt of the earth strike? <laughs> so one of the strike leaders at the time was a gentleman by the name of Arturo Flores. He grew up in the mining district. He became a miner. He got very active in, uh, lab in the labor movement. He also happened to be a very skilled amateur photographer. So he took dozens and dozens of photographs, the kinds of photographs museum curators salivate over because they're photographs 
of not the rich and the famous or the obvious architectural uh, structure, but what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, women meeting in the Manhattan bar, or it's photographs inside the union hall, or on the picket line, or guys sitting in the shade having lunch. Really slice, slice, of, uh, slice of life photographs, very rare. I have a friend who's retired now, but he was the curator of labor history at the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History and happened to be from New Mexico. So he is very familiar with this strike. And when I told him about this collection coming to the museum, I could hear him on the other end of the phone. I think he was salivating. <laughs> it's a great collection. So uh, Ashley Smith and Javi uh, uh, Marufo, our curator, are working to put together an exhibit of those materials. They're working with his son, um, uh, Arturo's son, Larry, who lives in Las Cruces and has the collection, will be giving it to us, to present this very, very important slice of life uh, view, as well as exploring the life of Arturo Flores, who went on to become a national labor leader and uh, very influential in our nation's history. So stay tuned. Okay, enough. Um, I'd like to bring aboard, bring up uh, Kathleen Norman, who is our new programs coordinator here at the Silver City Museum. Thank you, Norman. Hello, I'm very pleased to be here and pleased to be part of this great program. Our speaker today, you probably have heard of Danny Romero, our new director at the Western New Mexico University Museum. Danny was born and raised in Southern California and spent 11 years in Nevada managing archeological collections and working for the State Historic Preservation Office. Danny is a PhD candidate at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas focusing on membrane pottery and how it informs prehistoric interactions. She has spent most of her summers for the last nine years in the Membrays Valley, Silver City area, working on various field projects. Danielle recently joined our Grant County community as director of the WNMU Museum. Please help me in welcoming Danny. And today's program will follow the usual format. Danny will be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes. We'll have a handful of questions. And then we'll open it up to the audience. And we do have one panel member to talk more about our topic, the meaning of things. Thank you. All right. Well, it's still morning, so good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, today I'm going to be talking about the member ceramics and this kind of strange phenomenon that's happening with the landowners out here who have incorporated a lot of these ceramics to be family heirlooms. So my general outline, I'm going to start with an overview of the members' culture, talking about their chronological sequence and how their material culture changed over time. And then I'm going to bring in a more modern timeline when we, within the last century and a half, kind of brought the members back into the fold, the different booms of archaeological work and looting that we've seen in the area. And then I'm going to move into heirlooms and stuff and how that kind of relates back to the pottery. And then really talk about multivocality, since there are multiple voices involved when discussing members' pottery. I'm going to use my dissertation site, Elk Ridge, as an example of how I'm bringing together all these voices and uh, making a new exhibit at the museum that focuses on this. And then moving forward, what can we do from here on out to really continue to all talk to each other um, in a way that we can learn more about the members people. So the members were a branch of the larger Mogollon culture with general boundaries of the little Colorado to the north, the Verde to the west, the Pecos to the east, and we do know they go south into Chihuahua, but we're not sure how far. Uh, there are no distinct boundaries, so when you see this kind of run-in with the Hohokam and Ancestral Pueblo, there are gray zones, and we see a lot of hybrid cultural material happening in these areas. 
We often tend to think of the members as just primarily located in the members valley, but they're actually quite widespread throughout the area. Um, there are significant large sites within the town limits, and there's also a decent amount over near Cliff. Got to learn how to use the note system up here. So other branches of the Mogollon include the Upland Mogollon, who are probably the second most well-known branch, and they're primarily along the San Francisco River. We have the San Simone down to the southwest, who are virtually unknown. We've only found a few sites for them. Uh, the Eastern members on the other side of the Black Range, the Hornada, which span into West Texas, and then possibly a distinct Chihuahuan branch. The shared characteristics of these branches are the appearance of brownware pottery and pit house structures. The members had a very large interaction sphere that we have found through various artifacts. All of our shell that we see, the shell bracelets, all comes from the Gulf of California. We also seem to be getting our macaws, probably from the Gulf of Mexico. And we see Hohokam style imagery early on in the pit house period. So the members' cultural timeline is divided into three different periods, the first being the early pit house period, sometime around, the, uh, around AD 200 to 550. We do know the members are here prior to that, but they're hunter-gatherers, their campsites are very ephemeral, and most have just eroded away over time. Living structures for this period are semi-subterranean, circular, or oval pit structures clustered at sites that are located on isolated knolls. We do have some evidence of early communal structures or kivas at a few sites, including Wind Canyon and the site of McAnally. And McAnally is just across the river from the Maddox Ruin, which is the member's cultural heritage site. The earliest pottery dates to this time, and a lot of it is just plain wear. However, we are seeing the beginnings of red slips applied to the, brown, the, to the brown wear. That's not polished. We actually also get what we call fugitive red wear, which is the pot has been fired as a brown wear, and they have come in later and added a red hematite paint that actually uh, washes off if we're not too careful when we uh, find this stuff. We then move into the late pit house period, which is subsequently divided into three distinct phases marked by changes in architecture and ceramics. The first of these is the Georgetown phase, AD 550 to 650. And what we're seeing is a movement for, of these sites from the isolated knolls down to the first river terrace. Some pit houses were still circular, but we are starting to see more D-shaped structures. Uh, this key ceramic type is San Francisco red, so that red ware is now becoming highly polished. We are seeing the rise of textured wares or corrugated wares with a variety of different styles that continually develop. We're also starting to see these kivas become significantly more larger than households, so they're really starting to stand out, and rituals are probably becoming more important. The degree of sedatism during this phase is still highly debated. That move to the first river terrace does suggest that they were looking towards beginning agriculture. But the data we find with the animal remains and the macrobotanicals still point to a high dependence on wild foods. Moving into the San Francisco phase at AD 650 to 800, these households are becoming rectangular in shape with rounded corners, but those kivas are still remaining circular. This is where the first decorated ware comes in with Mogollon red on brown. And we see the emergence of pit house clusters and we believe that these are representative of extended family corporate groups. They tend to be centered around a co common courtyard or extramural area, and we, a lot of them share characteristics either in their architecture or an artifact within the pit house. So for example here, I have an overview shot of pit house 38 from the Harris site, which was the focus of my thesis. Uh, Pit House 37 is also in this cluster, and both of these structures had a planeware bowl plastered into the floor behind the hearth. Population and dependence on agriculture are continually increasing during this period. The last phase of this period is the three-circle phase at AD 800 to 1000. 
Uh, we still have the rectangular and square pit houses, and we are seeing the communal structures shift to be square as well. And again, still remaining almost double to three times the size of basic household structures. The key ceramics here are three circle red on white and the emergence of the first black on white pottery with style one. And we are tending to think that the purpose of three circle red on white was actually to get black on white, but they hadn't quite perfected the firing process to get the desired colors. We also see a increase in the durability of architecture, indicating that agriculture is probably highly dependent at this point and they're living at the sites year round. So examples of these things include the presence of storage pits, formal hearth construction, presence of plaster on both the wall and the floors, and evidence of remodeling of numerous uh, pit house structures. Moving into the classic period, we do know there is a transitional phase as they're moving into the Pueblos, but it is not well studied. There's only maybe one site out there that really has clear evidence of this transition. So a lot of that is still a work in progress. The classic period is AD 1000 to 1130, and it's the movement into these above ground adobe and masonry Pueblo structures often grouped together in room blocks. Pottery production reaches its height during this period. Of course, most well known for the figurative images and those possibly related to the scenes of daily life. An example here, we have this nice little agricultural scene on a shirt that we found at my dissertation site. We also see the emergence of polychrome pottery. So in addition to the black paint, we're seeing an orange to red color added to fill in some of the details. More often than not, the Pueblos are actually built on top of the pit house villages. So really, all those, the previous slides, when I'm talking about the pit houses, most of that information is only coming from one site, the Harris site, as it's the only late large pit house village that does not have a Pueblo component built on top of it in the Members Valley. So they were doing a lot of prehistoric disturbance and destruction. Uh, here I've included what is a fairly typical room that we see. Uh, they're generally five by five meters. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence of a post hole. It's the pointer on the screen. Over here in the back, um, one of the post holes. We hadn't quite reached the floor completely at this stage, so they're not too visible. Um, a double component hearth, and then in front of the hearth, you can see the remnants of the doorway with some of the door slabs still intact. Population and agricultural dependence are also at its height during this period. Uh, communal structures that we kind of saw before, you know, these large pit house structures kind of fall out of favor. Um, we're not too sure why, just some general shift in beliefs. So what we're seeing is actual, these communal rooms built into the room blocks, and they seem to be of varying sizes, so perhaps one is for the immediate family, one for the extended family, and one for the entire room block to share. At around 1130, this is when we get into the quote-unquote abandonment of the members, but we do have a better understanding of what was happening, although the picture is still not complete. We do know a fair amount of the members leave the area, a uh, fair amount go east as the eastern membrus starts to get a little more populated during this time. We also think some go east, go south, and become part of the Pakime culture. There are some other groups moving in. We do see some late Pueblo structures built on top of these larger sites, but after a few hundred years, the remaining people move away as well. Probably the main thing that the members are known for is of course their pottery. But not only are they important for the imagery, the pottery actually changes in a way that we can assign date to them. Schaefer and Brewington used the Nan Ranch collection to create the chronological sequence you see here, sometimes down to a 20 year period. So if we're missing those more absolute methods like radiocarbon dating with charcoal or tree rings, we can heavily rely on the pottery to give a great estimate of the date of the room. And if you have ever worked with radiocarbon sample, samples, sometimes a 50 year period with the ceramics is way better than a 200 year standard deviation that you can get with C14 dates. We see the first 
uh, naturalistic images pop up in the late style too. They're still very crude. Sometimes you really have to squint and think, is that a turtle or is it just a circle with some embellishments on it? And here you can see there is some overlap, that's actually complete overlap between style two late and style two three. And it's one of my research projects right now going off of something Harry Schaefer noted that he thinks that style two three was possibly one potter or a potting, potting family, seeing how closely all the ceramics from that type looked. Um, and with my research, it's actually showing that that potter probably exists at my dissertation site. Style three middle is the height. This is when we're seeing the most varied figurative and geometric designs. It's also the height of production. And I want to point out how unique it is that the members really were not bounded by any cultural norms of what could be placed on pottery. And this is universal. We can look cross-culturally at other prehistoric cultures, even on different continents. And what we see a lot of times is they're given a handful of designs, and that's what they stick to. And verging outside of those patterns could actually be punishable by death. But with the membrus, they can do whatever they want. And so we've really been able to get this look into their life ways and images of their daily life that's almost unheard of. What's interesting though, in style three late, we see an immediate drop off of production. A lot of the bowls that we see, they have these beautiful designs, but they're being used to the point where the designs are almost completely worn off. Overall construction does also start to falter. Seeing that most people are probably leaving the area, there's probably also a lack of resources to dedicate towards firing. It makes sense that production does drop off. Moving into what we know about the members more recently, they seem to come back into the fold around 1860s with a lot of the early families out here and some early explorers. In the 1880s is when Bandelier comes through the area and starts making note of a lot of the Pueblos, including the Maddox ruin. He actually called it the Goforth site, so there was a lot, about 100 years where he actually didn't realize that it had been noted in the 1800s. The 1920s to 1930s sees the first real boom of activity out here for the members, both in terms of academic research and the beginnings of looting and collecting. The most well-known archaeologists out here would have been Hattie and Burke Cosgrove at the Swartz Ruin and Ilmo Howry, who is working at Mogollon Village and the Harris site. And Howry's work here in the 1930s was actually what defined the Mogollon culture. Also the first large scale movement of collecting and looting, probably the most well-known collections are coming out of this period, including the Isley collection, which we have at the museum. What's interesting though, when you look at the notes, a lot of times these families who are digging their own land took extensively detailed notes that almost rivaled the detail that we try and reach today. They were making note of all the stratigraphic layers, taking into account how artifact numbers were changing as they were moving down. Whereas the archaeologists were going straight to the floor of these structures, not paying attention to a lot of these things. We see a second round of both academic and looting in the 1970s. The Members Foundation came through and excavated a number of sites, including the Maddox site. And they really set the groundwork for how we do archaeology today in the area, focusing on the detail, taking all those notes, going through and realizing that things that we would call trash fill actually do have significance. As far as the looting and collecting goes, not a whole lot of actual families doing collecting, but what we're seeing is a lot of the looters come in because this is the rise of the art market. There are stories of landowners who have significant sites who are actually start bulldozing their sites because they get sick and tired of being confronted with shotguns every day when looters come to get more pots. So it's kind of a, a troubled history in the 70s. Uh, we also see the rise of a lot of forgeries and the actual real pots still hiding somewhere in somebody's homes. Uh, 1989 is when we see the passage of the New Mexico Burial Law, which prohibits disturbing burials even on private land. Federal laws have been in effect for decades at this point with the Antiquities Act starting in 1906. 
However, when you think of the Gila National Forest and how large it is, there have never been the resources to really monitor all the sites we have. And then again, we see a little bit of a rise due to COVID, and this is primarily where I would just call it looting because it is for monetary gain. And when we talk about collecting in the early 1920s, a lot of it isn't necessarily to make a dollar. There are different mindsets about why people were digging their own land. Some of it was just general interest. What is this stuff below my feet? Others came at it from the perspective that if I leave it in the ground, it's going to degrade over time. If I can bring it inside, it'll be safe away from the elements. So even though we like to kind of blanket call it looting, there are a lot of different mindsets and a lot of reasons why uh, people were collecting. But today, I'm sure you all know, walking around Silver City, it is difficult not to notice the membrus. Whether it's an artifact in the museum, a local artist making replicas or using the design in another art medium, or just in logos. Members imagery here is entwined in daily life. I even know of various individuals while working in their garden will find pottery shards. So when it comes to talking about the members, lost the mouse on here. Um, it's not just the archaeology, and we have to talk about how, in some cases, these are becoming heirlooms for these long-standing families. So talking about objects of personal meaning, many, many of us automatically go towards the idea of heirlooms, objects that have been passed down through the generations that tell a story or create a link. These can include a variety of different things, including photographs, articles of clothing, quilts, toys, art, and jewelry, just to name a few. These items may be part of a larger collection or just a singular item. Many of you may have brought one of these things today to tell how the story of how you're connected to it. For most of these objects, though, we can get a general historic information, when it was made, by who, and where. Was it a family member? Was it in someone important at the local, state, or international level? Or perhaps a combination of those factors? Regardless of the breadth of historical information, there's always this personal connection. Perhaps this item is something that was handed down through the generations or brought out on special occasions. The current owner may have not even known the original owner, but that bridge has been created through the generations. Today, the earrings I have on were actually my great-grandmother's. I never met my great-grandmother. She passed a few years before I was born. These earrings were not passed to my grandmother nor to my mother. But instead, when my family was redoing the house my great-grandmother lived in, I found her jewelry box. And we had pretty close taste in style, so I often wear a lot of it. And it created this link that probably neither one of us would have ever thought was possible. And a lot of these things that have meaning, it's not just heirlooms, but collections as well. So cultural anthropologist Daniel Miller just refers to this as stuff. It's just stuff. And the reason he does that is, interestingly enough, Miller started off as an archaeologist and, of course, had to throw around the term material culture a lot. And he got kind of sick of it. There was too much baggage attached to it. The archaeologists would come with their theories intact and immediately apply those theories without kind of just coming in with a clear mind about what these things may mean. So using stuff is just a blank term that creates a blank slate, which really allows us to learn the meaning of something that, and its attachment to an individual. Our stuff is a reflection of our worldview and represents our own and our family's place in that world. These items don't have to be front and center in our daily lives, being in the periphery or perhaps even in a closet. They still have that meaning and can still affect our behavior and our identity. And the stuff isn't necessarily examined on its own. Remember, Miller was an archaeologist, so he's looking at the context. What is its relationship to other items an individual owns? Marco took this idea and furthered it that the value of these items isn't the price, but it's related to its association with an individual and with other items. But when it comes to this stuff in these collections, a lot of time we're just talking about one voice, perhaps a family or perhaps an individual. 
But when it comes to the members pottery, we really have to start diving into multivocality, as there are at least four different voices for members pottery. The members themselves, the archaeologists, historians, and those of us who work in museums, modern tribes, and the families that have these items. So multivocality, literally many voices. And what's interesting about multivocality for when it comes to archaeology, it was literally introduced just to have more archaeologists talking to each other. So instead of one archaeologist stuck in their academic bubble, he would just get his buddies that had closely aligned theories and just widen that bubble a little bit. But of course, that misses the point. So now the goal is to really include all the voices that have a say in what these artifacts are. The three primary voices for archaeologists usually are the members, the modern tribes, and of course, themselves. But with the members, it's complicated. They left no written record. We, they probably went in multiple directions when they left the area, and they may have been multi-ethnic to begin with. So when we think about it, there is no literal voice for the members. There is no one-to-one -one connection between modern people and who the members were back then. There's you know, possibly some cultural and some genetic relationships, but there is no one who is truly members today. So their voice is in their artifacts, and it takes somebody else to bring that voice out. With modern tribes, we rely on their oral histories. As we do know, there are a lot of these stories that are deep time and pan the entire Southwest. So I've had numerous friends of mine from various pueblos who can look at an artifact and see either a piece of clothing one of the images may be wearing or just a just simple design and say that is something that has been around forever and is shared by many Pueblo people. The archaeologists can then add their theories and scientific testing while utilizing this ethno ethno ethnography and oral history and combine all this information to really start to complete the full picture. But with the members, there's that fourth voice. And a lot of times, a lot of the archaeologists don't consider this voice. And it's something that really I'm one of the first to kind of bring forward in more, the more modern era. And that is of the landowners and the families. So many member sites, particularly those in the members' valley, are located on private land. In a lot of these cases, a single family has owned that land, perhaps even since the 1800s. So they've seen these you know, booms of you know, both this academic research, their own collecting and research on their property, and perhaps others coming in to loot. It's interesting to hear those stories because of those viewpoints that I talked about earlier. Was it interest? Was it curiosity? Did they think that this would be a better preservation method? Or was it just to sell this and make money? And these people that own this land and have owned it for decades really understand the land itself. They could possibly identify the prehistoric agricultural fields where archaeologists have very much struggled with that here. They may know the different sites on their property, not just the large pueblos, but you know the five, 10 room smaller ones that usually are missed during surveys. And they may know something about these unusual artifacts that we tend to see one-offs of in these collections. They also may know what happened to a site or what happened to one of the well-known artifacts that we've seen pictures of, but we don't know which collection it ended up in. And this all contributes to what we know about the members today. But for many families, these things just aren't necessarily part of a collection. There's actually deep inherent meaning as heirlooms. And it's interesting, working in the museum, even though I've only been there a few months, I'm starting to see what I call the five generation pattern for these longstanding families. The first generation probably collected vessels from various ranches, including their own land, somewhere in the early 1920s. The second generation, which is currently the oldest living generation, usually in the late 80s to early 90s, wants to see these artifacts stay together, whether it be in a donation or a loan, and have them on display in a museum, not only to show the member side of the story, but be in an in memoriam to their parents. The third generation is usually the generation that has to figure all this out. 
what museum will take it, what are the stipulations. We tend to see that the fourth generation doesn't have much interest and are kind of out of the picture. The fifth generation has more of an interest in particular items, not in the collection as a whole, and are fine with separating the artifacts and taking the key, key few pieces that they feel a connection to. But here we're talking about for almost 100 years, these items have been part of a family. They are part of a story. Family members are assigning value to these items based on association to great-great-grandparents. But we were talking about things that have already lived a life, that were used a thousand years ago by completely different people. Stuff that has now been imbued with an entirely new layer of meaning. So enter the Elk Ridge site. Um, and so I want to talk about how I'm currently setting up an exhibit that will try and bridge the gap and bring all of these voices together as really part of a community effort. So the Elk Ridge site is a classic period Pueblo of around 200 rooms. It is the last large Pueblo in the Mimbris Valley proper, and if you're familiar with the valley, it's just south of Camp Thunderbird. There is a small pit house component here, but most of the pit houses are located up on a ridge to the east of the site. The archaeology here is actually quite interesting. Uh, we have a number of formal turkey burials, uh, over 20 of them, and we actually have clear evidence of upland mogion people living at the site through visible differences in architecture and ceramics. But in modern times, the site has undergone a few different events. So the site is currently divided into two separate sections. The north section is currently owned by the US Forest Service and is this first section here. The Forest Service began testing in the Arroyo in 1990 as the Arroyo was actually heavily eroding the sites and burials were being exposed. They continue to monitor it, but around the early 2000s, it became evident that archaeological work was needed here to really preserve the site. So from 2015 to 2018, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, excavated the first two rows of rooms so that the rest of the site could be better preserved. And that is how I got involved with the site. So work on the northern section of the site has always been more or less academic, academic or preservation based. We've taken extensive notes, analyzed every single artifact we can find, and taking more samples than we know what to do with for current methods and then methods that may de be developed in the future to help us better understand the members' people. The southern half has always been privately owned. The owner in the 1980s actively dug, reaching the height in 1989, immediately prior to the passage of the burial law. So as you can see here, all this kind of dotted, lost the mouse again, all this dotted area in the second image is what he did, uh, primarily with a backhoe. There are some pretty fascinating oral stories about when he was digging, including people lined up along the fence line, bidding on the pots as they came out of the ground. There's also stories of him driving around town in his big car with his favorite pieces in his trunk, which he would actively show off to anyone who asked. And as I've learned from someone who knew him, Croteau made out like a bandit selling those pots. So as an archeologist, not something that I particularly like to hear, but this is a mindset that we find was quite common in 89. The subsequent landowner was an archeology span student who partnered with the cultural resource firm to try and figure out if they could salvage any information from the site. And as you can see, kind of up next to the, the damaged areas, we do see evidence of room blocks that they were able to piece together. And how we learned to watch out for turkey burials when we excavated our site, because our side, because they had found quite a lot. And in 2018, Croteau's son actually returned all of the artifacts that he had from the site and he gave them to the Imogen F. Wilson Education Foundation at the Maddox site, or the Members Cultural Heritage site. So how do we tell the story? The focus of the exhibit all comes together by including all of these voices. Obviously, the physical aspect are all these different artifacts that have been recovered from the site, which starts to tell the story of the Members people and who they were, how they lived. 
Next, we have to look towards the modern Pueblo peoples on what they can contribute to understanding the story, primarily through the images. Are these figurative and geometric pictures something that they've known about is deep time? Have, you know, are these myths that have been around for a thousand years? Are they shared by various Pueblo groups? Or are we talking about something that is truly unique to the Membrous Valley and the Membrous people? And then we move on to the family stories. With the Elk Ridge stuff, we don't really have that five generational story, but we do still have these oral histories of local people who were there. And it really tells the story, not necessarily of the members' people, but of the site itself and the land and what it has gone through since the members left the area. And so here is also the community effort and my general call of information I like to throw out to anyone that may have been there. Do you have photos? Did you know Curto? Maybe you have inherited some pots that came from the site. And this isn't necessarily a call for donation because I don't know where I'd put half of the stuff in the museum, but it's more just to get that information. Maybe create some kind of book about all the pots that came out of there, where they are now. If they're in silver, I'd love to see them. Maybe snap a photo of myself and get some measurements. And then together, the archaeologists and those of us in the museums can combine all of these voices and really try to paint the most complete picture of the members that we can, specifically at the Elk Ridge site. And it's one of the things when you have worked in the members, you know that the story of the Elk Ridge site is definitely not the story of any other member site out there. They are a middle range society. There are no overarching laws. So each site is truly unique in how the people lived, how, what the pottery was. And so moving forward, this is really just the beginning of members archeology. span Although work has really been going on here for a hundred years, we've really barely scratched the surface of what we know about the members people. A lot of early archeology span work just focused on the pottery. The people weren't really part of the story. But now there's the movement of people are not pots. People are people. There's the projectile points, the ground stone, the architecture, all of it comes together to form the story. And now it's also including the engagement of other people who aren't just the archeologists. What do the tribes have to say in regards to oral history? And what do the landowners have to say? A lot of what we know about site patterns and unusual artifacts, we wouldn't know if we didn't have the engagement with local landowners because the archeologists only see so many sites. And a lot of early survey work didn't necessarily cross onto private land. So there's a lot out there that we don't know about in terms of site patterns. And it's really to also reiterate that the museum is a resource. We're here for you to just bring your stuff in, even if it's just to learn about it. For some, it's gonna be a healing process, for some a learning process, for some it's a combination of a lot of things. So it's the goal of mine to find as much information as I can about the land when it was owned by Croteau. How many pots did he pull out of the ground? Where did they go? Did they stay locally? We know a lot of times even now, a lot of these pots are, make, pots are making their way overseas to collectors as the members have really created an international uh, field day right now for getting some of those pots. And it's also changing perspectives from archeologists. Um, early thoughts was, you know, the landowners were bad people for looting, for collecting. And a lot of times they were just ignored by the archeologists. But again, sometimes they have better notes. So it's important to really include them in these conversations. And really at this point, you know, I know when a lot of them reach out to me, there's some fear of what's going to happen to me. I have this collection that my grandfather dug up in the 1950s. Nothing, because we have no way to trace back where these pots came from. And if it was private land, it was fully within legal limits. <coughs> So again, the members are embedded here, and they were here before us. And in a few ways, or in a lot of ways, they're still here. And I just hope that 
as a community in Silver City, we can all come together to really hopefully understand as much as we can about the members and their life ways here. I'm the last lab that takes forever to load. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Danny, for that fascinating presentation. A lot of new approaches to the information, a lot of um, clarification for me. So now we're going to see if anybody in our audience today has some questions, and I bet you do. I think that Danny's really covered some new ground here, so I'm looking forward to what anybody else has to contribute or ask. And Bart is going to be schlepping the microscope, I mean the, the microphone around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Danny, Hi, Ted. Talked about diet this past week. We mm -hmm. talked about pottery. These conversations, we just talked about the use of turquoise mm -hmm. or obsidian among the membranes. Yeah, so obsidian is interesting. Is Here we go. There we go. So uh, obsidian is interesting. We do know a lot about the sources. We do know a lot's coming from Mule Creek, but a lot really hasn't been done in terms of how important it was to the people. Um, a lot of our obsidian points we tend to find, they're called bird points, so they're very small. They're only a few millimeters in size. And a lot of times they're not actually useful in daily life. They're being left behind in kivas and in households as ritual items. Turquoise is interesting, and it's something my advisor and I are currently thinking about doing a paper on, because when we see the turquoise pendants, they're always the same shape, always. There is no variation. And so, you know, compare that to the pottery where they can do whatever they want. When it comes to turquoise, there seems to be something dictating what can happen. Um, in terms of trade of turquoise, I don't know if they've ever really done much with that here. Uh, I don't know what the current situation is regarding sourcing, but I know just a few years ago you actually had to destroy the artifact to get at the sourcing. Um, so we're really not at that stage yet where we want to sacrifice a lot of stuff. Um, but that's really as far as it goes, um, you know, with the turquoise, with jewelry. You know, it's such a fascinating assemblage. Some of the little carvings that I've seen in the Nan Ranch collection are unbelievable, but you rarely see that in publications. And so it's also another one of the new exhibits I'm working on at the museum is to highlight the jewelry and the different, you know, aspects of it. And you know, what, where that piece was found, you know, was it in a room on the floor? Because that would indicate ritual. Or, you know, was it something that was left in the trash because it was broken? Good question. Anybody else? We're over there on the right part. <laughs> you can project, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, in regards to the pottery, how a lot of it is. Um, for the burial ritual, and I think that probably like accounts for why there's so many different depictions of like things because they didn't they just make that pot and save it for when they were going to be buried. So that was actually the early thought, um, and a lot of that stemmed from the early 20s research. Is they would just see the pot in the burial and assume mm. it was made for the burial, um, but the Nan Ranch. Uh, project actually changed that and what we actually see is only about 5% of pots from burials were never used in daily life. So 95% to about almost 98% were actually used in daily life. And you know, we don't understand the mechanisms for decisions regarding what pot was put in a burial, whether that pot has that kill hole at the bottom or not, um, and whether or not you got one vessel or you got many vessels. And do you know in regards to when people found that part, did they make any um, 
Like, what did they do with that? Were there human remains under any of that? What did they do with that? Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of the one of the tougher things to talk about, um, especially with the early collectors and looters. Um, I've heard firsthand that I would just throw the skull over my shoulder. The, the bones, the people didn't matter. Um, and so that was, especially for the looters, the mindset of, I don't know these people. They were here a thousand years ago. It doesn't matter to me. Um, a lot of the families who collected would take care of the bones. They would a lot of times just try and leave the bones in place and take the pot. Um, but for the most part, it was just, they were tossed aside. And of course, now we have federal laws, how those human remains are handled, the NAGPRA laws. Okay, got another question here. So, Danny, it seems like you, you're suggesting that new technology could allow us to do a much broader virtual collection mm -hmm. of, of antiquities or artifacts that would not necessarily physically pull the artifacts together, mm -hmm. but make them accessible and searchable in lots of strange ways. It seems like that would or could involve both the family landowners could involve other museums and universities and collectors, mm -hmm. and it could involve commercial dealers. Yeah. Do you have any sense of how receptive any of those folks would be? To um, it's it's still pretty tough out here. Um, a lot of the families that you know just did it out of curiosity, they are more willing to come to the table because they're they're interested. When it comes to those who are leading, looting and the dealers, it's almost impossible. You really have to pull their teeth to even get them to admit that maybe they didn't acquire these things within legal means. Um, I oftentimes check eBay uh, because that is one of the key sources. Well, we, we tend to see it ebb and flow with how much members pottery is up there. Um, I recently know of a fake that was sold um, build as real. Um, and so that's also part of the problem are these fakes. Um, I, you know, one of my goals is to really curb the art market. And, you know, if you want a member's pottery, there are beautiful replicas out there by local artists that you can acquire. And so, you know, but as these things sell on eBay, it really paints the picture of, oh, well, I can still go dig this stuff up and there is a market for it. Um, a lot of what's interesting is for like the big name art market dealers, I'm not getting them, but I'm getting people who worked for them who say this pot just kind of came back often, you know, it never really stayed sold. And in the end, they're like, well, do you just want it? And so, you know, you have the secretaries who will end up with a few pots and have called and said, you know, I don't want this. I don't feel comfortable with it. Here's what I know about it. Please take it off my hands. Um, so there's still a lot of work, um, especially in convincing some of these landowners that I'm not here to take your land. I, I don't have the resources to deal with it. You know, the Forest Service is definitely not going to want it. They don't have the resources to deal with the Gila. And so it's not about, you know, this kind of old belief of archaeologists of, you know, the landowners were bad. You know, we have to hold a grudge against them. You know, the newer generation, we've moved past that. It's time to actually sit down and talk to each other. But there is still that, you know, kind of guarded feeling of, I don't know how much I can tell you. And, you know, will you turn it around on me? But, you know, if anything really pre-89, there's a lot of times private land, they're within the legal limits, so there's nothing we can do. Um, a lot of these generational, so the family is saying, I don't know where this came from. It could have been federal, but I have no way to know. Neither do I. Um, so, you know, if it's not something you dug up yesterday, you know, you don't really have to worry too much about, you know, what the museum folks are trying to do. It's just information at this point. Next. So we just spent some time at Chaco, and of course part of the story there is that most, if not all, of the pottery remains found are made of earth that's not at Chaco. And that, I think part of the story of realizing that it was a gathering place or a ceremonial center. So I wonder, in your work or just the collection at the museum, do we think that any of the pots that are in the collection 
were made of earth from another place or from the place where they were found? So this is actually part of my dissertation. Oh, um, <laughs> so I could talk about it forever. Mm -hmm. um, but we have this great uh, way of do, doing chemical clay sourcing called neutron activation analysis. And the Members Valley, our soil and clay is distinct enough that each of these large pueblos actually has their own distinct clay source. So we've tested probably close to a thousand of these pots. 99% um, are coming back locally made and we can actually pinpoint which site they were actually made at. So we've been able to really do a lot of, you know, inter-site inter exchange. Uh, we know that in the classic period, sites that are kind of south in the valley can no longer produce their own pottery. We think it's just too dry in places down near Deming. So we actually know a lot about where pottery was made and the clay sources here. Uh, what we don't know is how they fired them because we have never found a kiln out here. Down here in the front. This is a pretty exciting uh, presentation. Um, you know, these pots have always told a story. A anybody looking at a, at, a, at a group of members' pieces, um, uh, immediately that narrative hits your head. And it's always amazed me that anthropologists have resisted a narrative in a, in a really big way. It's rather like history. It, if you tell a narrative, it ain't scientific. And scientific is what's the good part. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm really excited to hear that you're trying to get back mm -hmm. uh, to narrative. Yeah, and I made a connection last week at the Clay Festival with someone from the Santo Domingo Pueblo who's actually really interested in combining the oral histories with science to see, you know, do they match up? Do they kind of contradict each other? And, you know, he had extensive knowledge. You know, he would just see little tiny things on, you know, a figurative image and be like, that key piece of clothing, that's Pueblo knowledge. And it's something that all the Pueblos know here, but it's very specific to the Southwest. And I know at NMSU, they're really involved with the Hopi artists and getting their input on things. So we really are finally starting to see that shift to really open up and, you know, really get the tribal input because it is so important. And it's, you know, that's how we're going to even begin to understand what these images are. So now I have a follow-up. I, I was jacked <laughs> by my husband. So follow-up to my earlier question about the source of the earth. In your knowledge, where's the location that one of these pots came out of the ground the farthest away from perhaps where they were made? And I'm not talking about a collector who sent it to Europe. Right. I'm talking about right. it from an archaeological standpoint. The, the members' pottery, it's unusual that we don't see it move too far away. Um, but, you know, there will be a random site, you know, hundreds of miles away from here where one of the potteries will just show up. It's just one vessel. And so, you know, is it something that was prehistorically done or, you know, maybe someone modern moved it and was just like, oh, I'm just going to leave it here. Um, but for the most part, we don't see extensive movement outside of the general members area. Um, we do have, especially from my dissertation site, we are getting a better understanding of pottery being moved between the branches of the Mogollon. And we're seeing a lot more come in for corrugated wares because the upland do this thing called smudging where they burn black organics on the interior and polish it. It almost has an obsidian look. And I'm convinced that the members don't know how to do it. And so we see that coming in a lot. Uh, my site is actually producing it because we probably do have that upland family. So we're talking maybe a few hundred miles, but nothing, you know, really extensive. And, you know, it's, we also have to kind of shed modern views. We're like, oh, my God, 100 miles to them? Nothing. That would have been nothing. You know, that was an extended family who lived up there. And this was just, you know, going to visit them, bring a few pots back. Good question. I'm wondering, were we, they didn't have beasts of burden though, right? They were carrying everything on their back. And yeah. the pots are not light, some of them. No. Uh, 
And um, we do, they found some at the Nan Ranch collection um, in the room called the brewery. Um, we have these four just immense vessels that today, you know, if we want to move them around the museum, it takes three of us to carry mm -hmm. it. But we have two of them that were not made anywhere near here. And so we do have these kind of one-off examples of these heavy pots traveling, you know, from outside of the Mogollon. And we have no idea why, because for the most part, we see smaller jars move and something more reasonable, something I'd, I could carry. But, you know, when we see these large pots being brought in, it's, it's just one of those things that it's another question when it comes to understanding the members. Still a few mysteries. Um, many mysteries. <laughs> any, any final questions? We've got one more. This is a question about reading genetic material. Oh, it's complicated. Controversial. <laughs> yeah. It's very controversial. It's very political. Um, they did run, maybe in the 80s, I think it was, they did run a few samples from the Nan Ranch uh, because Harry was seeing things. He's like, I think these people may be non-local or, you know, he's like, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, and so they did run a number of samples, and they all came back to people in modern-day northern Mexico, so the Tarahumara, the Huichol, um, those living in the Sierra Madre Occidental. But, you know, that was just a small subset. Dave. Um, Hi, Dave. Thanks. Are there any traces of the membrane, the, the late membrane style, in any other pottery that, that would sort of help understand you know, where, the, where the people went to and maybe tie the oral histories of you know, modern Pueblo society to more directly to the membrane? That's complicated and it depends on the archaeologists you talk to about you know kind of how nuts we want to be with it trying to connect <laughs> some of these images. Um, as far as the, you know, the figurative stuff, we don't see it anywhere else. We think that wherever the members went, that group was probably like, you're not doing this anymore. You know, that's, that's a little too much. Um, as far as just geometric stuff, I tend to see it in the Casas Grande stuff. Um, we do know that down in Mato Ortiz, they, that village is actually on top of member sites. And, you know, I think they probably are somehow related, and you can see it in their pottery. But, you know, up here uh, with the Upland Mogollon, they, you know, being part of the Mogollon, but they didn't do any of the figurative stuff. Instead, they were kind of held within the limits of a lot of the stuff that we saw with the ancestral Pueblo and with their geometric designs. And so that has tended to survive. But, you know, the, the things that are very specific to the Membris, we get, you know, a lot of the oral history about the images, but none of that is really prevalent through time. Okay, I think that might be it. I think this wraps up our portion with Danny as our speaker. And now we're segueing right into the audience becoming speakers too. So we were looking at people sharing memories or possibly you brought something of um, value and significance. And we also have one from the museum, a tortilla maker that Ashley, our collections manager is going to speak about. Do you want to come up, Ashley? <laughs> we'll keep you here too. We'll keep okay. you here too, Danny, to <laughs> toss in any any additional comments or answers. So I didn't prepare any comments because I really wasn't told to. Um, I did bring an object that we hold within our collection, so we have a modern collection, which is going to be very different from Danny's, um, where we collect items from the community. And one of the items that we have collected from 1980 is when it was brought to us, was a homemade tortilla press. So give me one sec. And I'm going to be proper. I'm going to put on my gloves. 
I usually prefer nitrile gloves because you can actually feel things, but everybody likes the white gloves. <laughs> And it's a lot heavier than it looks. So it's clearly homemade out of pieces of wood. And it would hinge up. And they would open it and put the dough in, put it down, and then squish it flat. And it would make a nice little tortilla in the family home. So this is noted as having been made by the donor's husband. And this is where, for us, problems come in. Not enough questions were asked. What was the husband's name? Nobody told us. It just said he died 30 years before it was donated. So, and that he made it at home with wood, <laughs> which is kind of obvious. Um, so for us, the history is still living in a lot of ways. And we have the easy task of doing just a little bit of ancestry research, maybe asking if the donor's still alive, asking the donor a little bit more, or asking their ancestors, or doing research on ancestry.com, which I'm going to warn you now, Ancestry.com is not always 100% accurate. Um, everybody thinks they're related to Pocahontas. So <laughs> you need to be a little skeptical and do your own research. And this is also where oral histories come in that are very important for us. We go to the source. We need to ask questions. Because those are the people who are going to remember things. Now everybody's going to have a different memory, but that's really the beauty of history, is those different memories that everybody has from their emotional reaction to an object. So this could have an emotional reaction for some person, and another person's gonna be like, eh, it's just wood that squished dough, I don't really care. So it really depends on your attachment to something. And um, Javi actually brought something that's very similar to this that he uses in his everyday life that has more of a family attachment and an attachment for him. And, he brought a story. Yeah, and he brought a story that, no, he has the object. He does. And, um, That's where he and so I'm going to have him kind of talk about this, because this is an object within a museum, but the object for him, which if you could grab it, it's on the chair, um, is a living object. So within your homes, you have living objects that to you probably are just a thing that you use, but in the future, they could tell a really strong history, and maybe someone's going to come and ask you if they can borrow it for an exhibit. That's why we do loans. So I'm going to put this back and let Javi talk about his art. <laughs> Did everybody get a good look at the tortilla maker? Do you want a demo? <laughs> yeah. So Danny, I liked how you talked about, uh, you know, objects giving you a connection to the past. This is my most prized possession in my entire life. Uh, it belonged to my great-great-grandmother originally, more than 100 years ago. Uh, on the heels of the tortilla press, this is Michael Mal. Um, so it's been in the family for more than 100 years at this point. Um, literally thousands and thousands of tortillas have been made on this. Uh, in my own lifetime even, thousands of tortillas. Uh, you know, it's been passed down through all the women in my family. And then my mom didn't want to learn how to make tortillas, and none of my cousins did, so it became mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, it just represents so much to me. You know, the fact that it's a comal, which is, you know, a typically Mexican-American, Mexican way to cook. Um, it belonged to, you know, a long line of mothers who taught their children how to cook. And, you know, something that I use in my everyday life. I used it yesterday. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I just love this idea of objects holding some sort of value to people and becoming heirlooms. Um, so this is mine. Thanks for letting me show it off. <laughs> Thank you, Javi. Now who is in the audience today has a story or something to show? Can I re Okay. So Danny, I was interested in your talking about your earrings and um, sort of an emotional 
connection that you have with them because they come from your blood, but you don't know they belong to. And as a historic being a chronicler when we travel, and um, I have things in my possession that belong to people in my family that I never knew or had a relationship with. And what I wonder is just in general, do we think that attachment to those material culture pieces are more important to folks like us who come from or is it a gender thing? Or I mean Javi just proved me wrong on that, where you know girls seem to have more of an attachment to things from grandma or great grandma. And I just wonder even what the audience thinks about that. Is it um, are there people here that don't care about something that their great grandmother made her have? Stuff. People don't care about stuff. So I just wonder, is it more emotional? Is it more female? Is it, you know, what, where does that come from in, in your experience? For me, it's always been very general. I've never personally seen a pattern for it. Um, I know for me personally, it was, I could never really get my mom to open up about her family. And so, you know, I was going to be moving into their house, you know, this house that had been sitting empty for 30 years. But yet I almost knew nothing about her. I knew her name was Margaret. I knew she was from the Czech Republic and that's it. And so for me, it was a way to almost get a sense of her personality and who she was by seeing the things that she had left behind. Um, and I know I have some strange collections myself. Um, my grandmother and I collected bicentennial quarters uh, for really no reason. We, we just picked them and so whenever we would get one, we would save it and put them all together. Um, I still have that collection I, and I will probably never get rid of it because I know she probably touched every one of those quarters. And when she passed, I made sure she was buried with one. And so it's even these things that, you know, it's not something we wore every day or it's not something we made, it's, you know, general currency that ended up having these meanings. And as far as gender, I really haven't seen too much of it leaning female or male. I think it's more family history, you know, how much interest do you have in your own family history? Um, and maybe connection level with the ancestors and how much you knew about your relatives that may be passed before you were there. Um, and a lot of times also just what my parents or like what someone's parents put value on. Um, I know my dad is way more interested in his family history and growing up very poor, he didn't have any of these things that he could bring with him and so now it's you know well I wish I had you know my grandmother's Komal but he doesn't he has nothing and so I think that also was like you know keep these little things that mean something to you because it could always be that remembrance of a story and the connection to someone whether you knew them or not. So I love the work that Danny's doing at the museum right now. It's, it's groundbreaking and really connecting generations of people who've, all, who've made or owned Mimbrae's pottery to the story, to the bigger story. So you're doing fantastic work, not just with the archeology, span using native voices to understand images more about Mimbrae's, but bringing the story current. How do people value these? So, this is what we're attempting to do at today's uh, session, which is museums are all about objects. You're, if you don't have objects, you're not a museum. But the mark of a good museum is what it does with those objects and how it helps people think. So there's a plant in the audience with an object having to do with plants. <laughs> <laughs> this is my grandfather's dibble. Does everybody know what a dibble is? A, a dibble is used to plant seeds or set plants. And this was a little bit of archeology span in my family. So my, I never met my father's father, uh, but digging around in the basement um, around college age, I find this on a beam in our basement. And I, I didn't quite know what it was. It wasn't, I did, maybe it was a toy gun. I, I didn't know what it was. So I asked my dad, and he said, oh yeah, grandpa used that to plant his tomatoes and his peppers. And it, 
it took on meaning for me, you know. Um, you're not, probably not going to find one of these at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> <laughs> but it's become an important family heirloom. My son knows about this, and my brothers and sisters know about this. But it's a, it means something to me. And if we could generate a conversation about how objects contain meanings, we'll help you all become better museum goers and see things that you don't quite know what it is, but you understand there's a meaning behind it, and hopefully we can help you learn more about the stuff in our collection. So, Grandpa's Dibble. <laughs> Bart, it seems to me that um, people, the museum directors out west, have a bigger, a harder duty than those back east. Um, when I went to school in, in Philly, uh, I went to houses that were museums. It, they were just crammed with stuff like your grandfather's devil. Um, and they sloughed all that stuff. You know, there are stories about people in the, uh, in the uh, Conestoga wagons. They put, uh, they put the pianos and, and the sideboards on the on the Conestoga, and the first 15 miles, they shut those things and threw them, threw them out on the prairie. And those things didn't arrive back uh, to the West. So it seems to me it's really hard sometimes. Um, she mentioned her, her father not having uh, those, um, those objects. Uh, uh, sometimes don't even have pictures. My wife, uh, who was an agricultural migrant, did, didn't have a picture before she was 20 years old. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, except for the Mimbres and Native Americans, um, the rest of us are here not too long ago. So that history isn't that deep. And your point about not having the material culture with it is is really interesting. It makes the West so much more fascinating. <laughs> to me, the significance of the approach that's discussed here and that Bart has just talked about in Javi is that it's it makes the significance of the object more accessible because people can relate on a sociological level when they hear personal stories. When I see a, is it a dribble or a dibble or whatever in the future? I was right. <laughs> dibble. So, so when I see something shaped like that now in the future, I'm going to remember the story that Bart told and I'm going to understand the significance of that artifact. So kudos to you for looking at this pottery from a different perspective because it makes its significance more accessible to the common people who aren't trained as historians or archeologists. And it's also helping to really bridge the gap for those landowners that tend to be more hesitant um, to have someone who's you know, willing to listen to their story. Because for them, it's you know, not just this prehistoric object. It's, you know, oh, when I was five, I was with my grandfather tilling the field and this pot came, this pot came out of the ground. So, you know, it helps us to really be able to communicate and, you know, sit down together and tell the stories. Any other contributions? Yes. seems like there's kind of two different uh, ways to look at it, like things that were useful. Like I think in my mom's family, like there was a big oxen yoke that hung on the wall and um, it's considered to be a treasure because of the tradition of farming in the family. But then there are also things like the grandfather clock, you know, that were decorative and hold memories of space and family. And so it's kind of interesting to think about functional versus decorative 
objects and their value. My grandfather, great-grandfather was a country doctor and his wife collected a collection of 800 perfume bottles. So we all cherish those in the family and my grandmother, the daughter-in-law, sold a few, but they're dispersed throughout myself and my six sisters. So that's something that we cherish for the connection with grandma and great-grandma, but also kind of a curiosity of where she may have traveled and where she may have acquired this large collection of small perfume bottles, fragrance bottles. And we also even have evidence of the members themselves doing things that we might consider heirlooms. We sometimes will find these projectile points that date thousands of years prior. And so, you know, maybe one of them saw it, picked it up, and, you know, maybe had no recollection of what it would be used for, where it came from, but was creating this connection to people that had been on the land before. Um, at my dissertation site, we also found a little vessel that was made by a child. We could see the little fingerprints in it, and we actually found it on a shelf in the house. So, you know, that kind of mentality of, you know, proud parent, you know, my kid made this, you know, almost tends to go back in time. And, you know, those little bridges that, you know, psychology maybe hasn't changed all that much. And, you know, people are people. Okay, I think that might be all. What do you say, Bart? I think we might want to thank our co-sponsor. Okay, so thank you very much, Danny, for presenting. We're very fortunate to have you here. I sure do. Thank you, Javi. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, audience. Thank you for committing part of your Saturday afternoon to joining us here. And also would like to say a thank you to our sponsors, Will, the Western Institute for Lifelong Learning, Fiesta Latina, LULAC, the Southwest Fiesta of the Word, Grant, Archaeology, Grant County Archaeology Society and Toad Creek Town. Thank you for making this And we'll see you again, again one month from here, one month from now, to join us for the presentation on how flavor and taste are expressed part of cultural identity. So we'll look forward to that. Denise Chavez is coming. She is sharing recipes from her Taco Testimony book, and it should be a wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody.